Hi, it's Carolyn, and it's Kentucky Derby Week in September. With the global pandemic causing America's most traditional horse race to abandon its date for the first Saturday in May, horsemen had to make dramatic adjustments to racing plans for their most talented three-year-olds. Trainer Barkley Tag altered course last spring with his Kentucky Derby-bound colt Tis the Law and managed to have the Florida Derby winner primed for an improvised version of the Belmont in late June. Tis the Law kicked away to win the Belmont Stakes and romped in the Grade 1 Traverse as well. Now the New York bred is the favorite for Saturday's Kentucky Derby. Trainer Barkley Tag knows what it is to win the Kentucky Derby, and even with a New York bred, as he did back in 2003 with Funny Side. And maybe the thing I enjoy the most about the Barkley Tag stable? It's all about the horses. Here's more from the understated and workmanlike trainer Barkley Tag, whose career has been sprinkled with moments of brilliance. This is Racehorses Etc., the podcast celebrating horsemanship. I'm Carolyn Conley. I've covered horse racing on TV for over a decade, exercised some of the best horses in the world, and represented top jockeys. Here, I speak to icons and everyday racing folks to deepen our understanding of horsemanship. Barkley, thank you so much for joining me here on Racehorses, etc. You're welcome. So you are training the favorite for the Kentucky Derby in this unusual year where we're waiting for the first Saturday in September. How is Tis the Law doing? Tis the Law is doing fine. He's, he's, he, he does what we ask him every day, and uh, he's no problems. We're very fortunate. Well, he's a lovely horse, and I understand he's quite different than Funny Side, who was very tough and not quite as malleable, you said, as this horse. So it looks like this horse um, is a pleasure to work with. He is a pleasure to work with. I mean, he's strong, and he's strong-willed, too, but, I mean, he's easy to keep under control, and uh, we have never given him a chance to do anything wrong. So <laughs> he's, uh, he does the same routine every day. He gets out to graze every afternoon for an hour or so. And uh, we, we keep it pretty much the same for it. You mentioned routine and this Racehorses, et cetera, this podcast is about horsemanship. Routine is a big part of horsemanship. How has that played into your success over the years? Oh, I don't know. Uh, my success has come and gone a million times. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know. I do, we just try and do the right thing by the horses all the time. That's all. We just We try and do the right thing. That's that's all you can do. And the horses are creatures of habit. And uh, we try and get them into good habits and stay in good habits. And you mentioned not letting a horse have the opportunity to do something wrong. Give me more details on that. How do you prevent that through the course of a morning training session? Well, his groom will lead him out on foot. And I'll be right there on the pony. And when we get to the track, he hands the, the uh, lead shank to me. And then I pony the horse around to where we like to break off and, and have a gallop, which is about three quarters of a mile on the other side. And then we turn around and we let him gallop. And uh, usually Robin's on him or Heather, one or the other, are, are on him. And uh, he gallops a mile and a half every day, a mile and a half, mile and three quarters, somewhere in there every day. And uh, then I, I meet him where he pulls up and I take him back down to the groom who leads him back home. And then he gets his bath and he's walked cool and he grazes for a while. He gets a lot of attention. It's a lot of attention. The, the, the groom is, is uh, also one of my assistants and uh, his, his full-time duty is that horse. Wonderful. All eyes on him, tis the law. That sounds like a lovely morning. And when you look back at your career, Barkley, what horseman has had the biggest influence on the way you do things? Oh, I'd say several of them, really. Um, well, I did horses my whole life. Like I, like I took riding lessons when I was 11 years old. I took about three lessons and I didn't have any more money. So I went to work for the guy so I could keep riding. And uh, that developed into some showing and show horses and things like that. And after a few years of that, I was off to college I didn't do anything with horses for the four years I was in college. And then uh, after that, I got, a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I got a job managing a big farm that had cattle and sheep and horses and uh, racehorses, polo ponies, and uh, 
steeplechase horses and everything like that. So got into that kind of a bit. It was a horsey area where we were, and uh, it just kept going on from there. And after a while, I started riding steeplechase races just to have a bit of fun. And uh, when I stopped doing that, I had a guy give me gave me one horse because I didn't have anything to train. I wanted to be a trainer. So he said, well, I'll give you this horse that I, I didn't get paid on. And uh, you can see what you can do with him and maybe work it into something. So I went off to Pimlico and I raced that little horse and galloped horses for a friend of mine at the same time who was a, a very good trainer. And it just kept going like that. I'd pick up two or three more horses and work with them a while, and then I'd lose them and then pick up more horses, and it went back and forth for about, about a good 10 years of uh, chicken today and feathers tomorrow, you know. So after that, I, I finally uh, got lucky, and I bought a real nice horse, and uh, he kind of gave me a head start on things, and other people started sending me horses and had some luck with some of them right off the bat, and it, it built into it, and then there were hard times and good times and hard times and good times. But uh, finally, we were doing well enough that I thought I'd move the outfit to New York. And then I started struggling all over again. And finally, that materialized into things. And uh, Jack Knowlton was one of my early patrons up there. And uh, we got very lucky together. And we had two of the... He, 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 would, he would work just with New York Reds, but we were able to acquire two of the best New York Reds that ever lived. And uh, that, that's that been a big part of my career also. Funny side and tis the law. That's so exciting with New York Reds. And you mentioned that you galloped horses and you were training horses at the same time. And you galloped for a good trainer. You said, are you talking about Hall of Fame trainer Frank Whiteley? No, I did work for Frank. Uh, one, one season, I, one year I worked for Frank. Um, I was just real low on horses, and I was kind of discouraged that year. And uh, I went down to Camden and got a job with him as a as an assistant. And he didn't want me to ride; he just wanted me to be an assistant. But then he, he didn't have a lot of really good riders, <laughs> and I started getting on horses, and I started doing a lot of riding for him and assisting too, and all that. It was a it was a hard job, but it was a good job. And he uh, he was uh, had his own way of doing things, but uh, he did things right. And uh, I learned I learned a lot there, and a, a lot of it's just practice. You know, I mean, you, you get up every morning, seven days a week, and you go to work with your horses, and uh, you either learn it or you don't. Well, you said he had his own way of doing things, Frank Whiteley. What do, What do you mean by that? He He was all about the horse. He He never did anything else either. He just took care of his horses well. Saw that they got grazed in the afternoons. Uh, he he didn't like veterinary work at all on them if he could help it. And uh, he just said they don't need that. They need attention. They don't need anything else. And I've always kind of relied on that when I'd be confused about what to do with this or what to do with that. I would just give them attention until it came around or didn't come around. And, and it usually worked out pretty well for me that way. You know, like we'll stand them in tubs with ice water. It, uh, to cool their ankles down and their knees down and pour ice water over them and stuff like that. We hose them a lot, run a cold hose on them. Unfortunately, in Florida, the hose water is never cold, but uh, in New York it is, and uh, it's very therapeutic for the horses. It's good for their muscles and tendons and ligaments and things like that. We do a lot of that, and we do a lot of icing them and you know, standing them in a tub of water with, with ice, and uh, they don't... Their legs are, don't have a way of uh, pushing circulation up and down very well. And uh, especially when they're in captivity like this, if they're out roaming the pastures night and day, why then they're, they don't have those leg problems. But when they're in captivity like this, they don't get to use their legs 24 hours a day in that respect. And they need a lot of stimulation. And we give them a lot of stimulation with ice water and hosing and um whirlpooling and those kind of things. Some would call that old school horsemanship. And uh, I certainly honor that. It seems like you're spending more time with the horse in those situations. As you said, a lot of attention. 
And then do you feel like your people and yourself, you're picking up more from the horse in terms of what they need? Well, I would think so. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't particularly like the term old school, but uh, cause I've been doing this for 50 years now, all day, every day. And I don't see a whole lot of difference. I mean, uh, you know, veterinary work has, has become more pronounced in a way, but they've got better, better things. Now I don't mean drugging horses and that kind of stuff. I mean, they've got better, better ways of taking care of them, just like people. And, uh, you know, you have to know when to use it and when not to use it and things like that. But uh, you, you, you can't go without some veterinary bills. That's all there is to it. It's just you don't send your kid to you don't send your kid to kindergarten and expect it not to catch a cold and you inoculate them and all that kind of stuff. You have to do the same thing with horses. It's 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 a modern care, but there's a certain amount of it they have to have. But if you walked into a football locker room and you'd see guys sitting in a tub of ice, and you'd see other guys getting a massage, and you'd see other people getting something else. And it's the same way with this stable. There's always something going on where horses are getting one kind of a treatment or another, uh, therapeutic, you know, and, uh, and uh, we just do it. We do it all day, all, every day. So, and, and when you say we, Robin Smullen, your assistant trainer and life partner is right there beside you. What do you two share in common in terms of your approach to horsemanship? Well, it's just everything. We, we, we see the horses every day. We get down. As soon as we get here in the morning, we check all the legs. We check whether they ate last night or not and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we make decisions that way. And uh, we run the decisions we have beside, be, across from each other. It's like two heads are better than one. And it, it's worked out very well for us. It certainly has. What part of the day do you enjoy the most? Uh, in the afternoon, when the feature race runs and we win it, <laughs> sometimes that's like four thirty, or it might go all the way up to seven. <laughs> it's funny. Some trainers will say the morning. Yeah, no, yeah. I enjoy. I enjoy the mornings. We've had beautiful mornings up here at Saratoga this year. I don't think I've ever seen better weather at Saratoga than than it's been this year. I mean, the last 10 mornings in a row, one was rainy and all the rest were just gorgeous sunrises. So, and the weather's been a little chillier and it's just been beautiful here. And, uh, you know, I think if I was an invalid and couldn't do that, I, I would, I would be very unhappy. Well, you're out there every day on the pony and it's great to see you. I remember last summer seeing you on the pony at Saratoga and I came up to you and I said, you know what, Barkley, the magic is still here at Saratoga. And even this year, things are so different. The fans aren't there. The owners aren't there. But there's still a little bit of magic up at the spa. Absolutely. There really is. And everybody realizes it, too. I mean, the people that like Saratoga still like Saratoga, even though it's been quieter. Actually, quiet's not always bad, you know. So it's, uh, you know, if you have a high-strung horse, it's been a little easier this year. If if you have a few high-strung horses that not not quite the – crowd of horses and crowd of people and things like that. It's just a little easier to get things done sometimes. And I'm not diminishing it. Saratoga is exciting no matter what. And especially when it's going full bloom, but this year has been different, but it, uh, I don't think it's affected us in a, in a derogatory way in any, any, any sense of it. Well, it's interesting. I think horsemanship is intuitive by nature at its very best. And I would think with a little bit more quiet, you might have, almost more access to that in a way. Well, it helps. I think it helps. Yeah. Yeah. Some, I mean, horses, horses don't react well to loud noises. And I think uh, right. a, a little quieter atmosphere, it's easy, easier to get things done with. Yeah. Agreed. Some of the greatest horsemen of all time have gone through Saratoga and Belmont Park and in Maryland and Pennsylvania places. You've spent a lot of time. Who are the horsemen that you've admired the most over the years? Well, Frank Whiteley, for one, I like the way he did things. And uh, he was very conservative, very, very conservative. And when he, he got his hands on a lot of good horses that way. Um, it's the kind of way I like to do things. I, I, I'd like to, I like to train nice horses for nice people. I'm not a big claiming trainer. Um, I don't care about quantity. Uh, and I don't mean that to demean the, the other part of the game either. I just, I just... I'd, I'd rather have nice people to work for and nice horses to work on. And uh, it's it's just, I just enjoy it more that way. 
uh, standing there in the afternoon and looking at horses' ankles that are galloping by and things like that to see if I want to claim them the next week. Uh, that's just It's just never interested me. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. A lot of people do very well that way and make a good living, and it's still horsemanship. But uh, it just it just never interested me that much. And uh, I just hope people will come along that have enough money to have good horses, and we can buy them in sales and things like that. And uh, it's, that's what's fun for me. And you've done well picking out horses at the sale. I know you had a teeny bit of caution on Tis the Law with his wide eye, but Robin kind of encouraged you to just go for it, uh, and it turned out well. I, I just made a statement after we bought him. I said, I just can't believe I bought a horse with a white ring around his eyes. Yeah. Well, it's something people can identify with. That It's an old wives' tale, I guess. It wasn't, it wasn't going to stop me from buying him, believe me. It's just, it's just, uh... With Frank Whiteley, he was known for a couple, well, many great horses, but two of them, Ruffian and Forgo, are absolutely legendary. What do you remember about those two horses? Well, I was fortunate enough to, the, the first year I worked for Whiteley, uh, Ruffian was a two-year-old. And uh, I galloped her a lot all winter because I was a little bigger than some of the riders. And she was a great, big, heavy set filly at the time. And uh, I, I got on her a lot. There was another fellow named Squ- Squeaky, I think his name was. <laughs> and uh, he, he was my size, too. So we, we galloped her a lot. When we got to, when we got up to New York and they had the real serious training, whether or why he put a lighter boy on her, but um, she was magnificent. I mean, she just in her in her first race, it was a five and a half furlong race, and she equaled the track record and won by fifteen lengths. So I mean, it just and and she just kept getting better and better. So uh, she was she was scary, <laughs> but uh, she got a little shadow on an X-ray after her fifth race that first year and the x-rays weren't much good in those days that was 50 years ago and they weren't much the the x-rays just weren't like they are now and uh, but the opinion was there might be something starting there so we're going to arrest her and they arrested her and then we brought her back the next year and 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 she won again until she got hurt badly and I, i wasn't with him that year so four ago always caught my eye because he was a really nice horse and uh there was another man training him when I was there with Frank. And then that guy retired and they gave the horse to Frank. I, I can't say he was lucky because he was a really good horseman, but he was lucky that way. He'd just people would send him good horses, you know, and uh, he'd go on with it. He always made him better. Forgo was known for carrying so much weight. Well, Kelso carried a lot of weight and Forgo was a much huskier horse than Kelso ever was. And Kelso carried like 135 pounds every time he ran. He was, he was unbelievable. He was, he was, kind of a, a a lighter weight, lighter bodied type of horse than Forgo. And uh, he still carried, carried that weight and ran hard and won a lot of races. He was, I, I wasn't really in the racing business when he was prominent, but I wish I was because <laughs> uh, I would have watched him a lot closer if he did. But, but uh, he was a pretty darn good horse. One of the best. What do you remember about Galloping Ruffian? We called her Sophie because she was like a big old sofa. <laughs> but she she did, she did everything right. She did everything right. She was a nice filly to gallop. Uh, she got stronger and stronger and stronger though as she got fitter and and uh, then the little guys couldn't hold her anyway. So. <laughs> but uh, it was nice nice to be around the horse that way. I promise you, she was outstanding. Right. Well, trainer Todd Pletcher paid you quite a nice compliment. He said that you're not only very experienced, but you're very skilled as a trainer. What do you think the most important skills are for young trainers trying to develop their craft? Well, you've got to have patience. And that was very nice for Todd to say that, actually. But he's, he's a class act. He's always has been. He's uh, never been out of character. I've, I've never seen him when he wasn't just top-notch trainer and human being but anyway um i appreciate him saying nice things about me but uh what was the question you asked me (laughs) what skills are most important for young trainers to develop as they're honing their craft well you've got to watch how your horses train every day and you've got to take things into consideration did you do too much today or did the horse do too much 
And should you do a little less with him tomorrow or should you alter this or alter that? I mean, it's just it's a, it's an ongoing thing. You have to use your what skills you have all the time. And you're training more than one horse usually. So you've got to get the idiosyncrasies of each horse in your mind and know what to look for in the coming days before you run them and things like that. There's, there's a lot to it. And we just spend all day, every day doing that. Uh, some people are smarter than I am. They don't have to do it, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not that smart, really. Then I, I just have to be on top of it all the time. And then I have Robin, who's smart as a whip, which makes makes my job really easy that way. So, Yeah, she's quite a horsewoman, um, for sure. And I'd love to have her on one day soon. Um, when you look back at your mentors and the people you admired, like Frank Whiteley, what would you say is the most important thing Frank taught you? The horses need attention. He said, they don't need drugs. They don't need all that other stuff. They need attention. And that's what he did. And that's what he made us do. And uh, Shug McGee came up under Frank. He's a Hall of Fame trainer. And uh, he's got one. He's probably got the best job all the way around <laughs> that there ever was. But uh, he, he's done well with it. And he's a, he's a great guy, you know. And Todd also. I mean, Todd. Todd was born a horseman, and uh, uh, he's he's superior at what he does. He's got a memory too. He and Billy Mott have memories like elephants. <laughs> and they're 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 really really good at that. And it's a big help. It's a big help. That's that's another great quality that Robin has. She has a memory. She can remember a horse that had a scratch on his left hind ankle twelve years ago, and. <laughs> And how we treated it and whether it got better or didn't and all that. I mean, she's just got a fantastic memory. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. What a huge asset for the su success of your stable. And every day, Barkley, you're out on the pony. Um, what what do you like about being on the pony versus being on the rail when you're training your horses? Um, well, I can help somebody if they need help. If, they've, uh, if, if the rain broke or something like that, I can go help them. Uh, I can lead one of my people on it on a very bad horse that goes better with a pony till you get him started, you know, or something like that. Or if you want to take them back to the starting gate, I can lead them back to the starting gate because some horses will balk about doing that and not want to do it. And if you got them with the pony, you can get them back there easier. And I can get to them easily on a pony. I can't take a car in on the track and run around at the half mile pole and pick somebody up that fell off, but I can get around there on a pony. And uh, it's just, you can just stay right in there. I like to be on the pony. You can stay right in there with it all the time. Uh, put you in the game, so, hands on where you need to be, where you're at your best. Exactly. You talked about the ups and downs of training and how some years were chicken and others were feathers. What got you through those tough times? <laughs> hard work. <laughs> just plain hard work, that's all. I mean, I got to a point where I couldn't go back. I had to keep going. I had to get up every morning at four o'clock and go to work seven days a week. And I've never stopped it. So I never, I never became uh, superior at it or anything else, but uh, I, I did it. I'd say damn good at it. <laughs> well, is it, you know, you, you, you look at what other people do, what Frank Whiteley did. I mean, he, he was, a, he had a lot to do with me. And uh, but I, I watched Alan Jerkins was a good friend and he had his way of doing things that were different than a lot of people, but very successful for him. And uh, he was a very, very interesting person and had a philosophy and a theory about everything. And uh, he became a very good friend. We went to dinner a lot together and stuff like that. And, and uh, we discussed all this kind of stuff. And uh, he was a big influence, too. I mean, it was just, I think a lot of us influence each other in some ways, too. You know, it's just, uh, I, I watch what Todd does in the mornings whenever I see him, and I watch what uh, Shug McGahee does and other trainers. I watch Woody Stevens back in his day. A lot of them did things a little differently, but, uh, and some of them were just plain good at it, and some of them were lucky at it. You know, they just, it was all kinds, just like there is in the world. That's all there is to it. There's more than one way to run a ranch or train a horse or anything else, I guess. But 
they, the, the ones, that, the trainers that were really astute, I always watched closely and see what you could learn, you know. When you talk about Alan Jerkins and Woody Stevens, do you remember an incident where one of them did something that you would consider unusual at this stage, you know, that surprised you and was successful or that you found remarkable? Well, I think Alan Jerkins beat Secretariat three times with 30 to one shots, <laughs> something like that. I don't know the exact thing, but <laughs> he was uncanny with some of the things he pulled off. He was really uncanny. Like what? Very good horseman, very dedicated. He'd get up from the supper table at, at 6.30. No matter where you were, you could be at Queen Elizabeth's party, and he'd get up out and go back and water his horses off, and pick up the droppings, and take a sandwich to his night watchman and stuff like that. And he did that relentlessly seven days a week. He, I, I, don't, I don't think he ever sat at the dinner table very long. No matter, We, we could be having a great discussion, but when, the, when that bell in his head rang, he was off to the stable. There was a picture of him. There was a great picture of him. Uh, we had a eulogy for him down at the at the Gulfstream after he passed away. And one of the pictures they showed was him sitting on a bale in a tuxedo, filling a water bucket with a hose. And and his son got up and said, "This was thirty minutes. This was thirty minutes before he walked my sister down the aisle." So there's dedication. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. Well, you've had the real privilege of being around guys like that um, in New York. So I'm, I'm sure you look back at that fondly. He had his own way. He, he trained them pretty hard. And, uh, but it worked for him. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's all what works for you. You know, I do it a little differently now, but everybody does. Uh, and even Alan didn't work him, you know, in the past few years of, of his career like he did in the early part of his career, but the horses couldn't take that nowadays either. Uh, they, they've been inbred so much, you know, that they're a little more delicate, but <laughs> excuse me. Um, uh, it was very interesting though. I mean, it's just another way of doing things and he was very successful at it. And success is the success is the main word. Yep. I think with horsemen like you, it's something innate that to, to some extent is indescribable, a, a skill or a talent that you have with these horses. And I'm glad that you're having another opportunity recently to show what you've got. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you being here and I wish you the best of luck on the first Saturday in September. Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure not only have I have you on the show, but to watch you train your horses in the morning. Well, thank you, Carolyn. That's very nice. Appreciate it. Will you take care, Barkley, and I'll see you soon. Bye now. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Racehorses Etc. Please go to carolynconley.com and become a Racehorses Insider. We'll keep you up to date with exclusive content and more. That's it for now. Remember, until we meet again, enjoy the horses.